Hey guys, how's it going? Anthony Mutraja here. Hope you're well. Well, if I haven't already said this enough number of times, do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you already haven't. Um, I try to post regular lessons on here and um, hopefully it's regular enough. I will push myself to post more. Anyway, so I thought I will talk about something which is of heavy interest to bass players and guitar players. Fretboard knowledge, fretboard efficiency, aka mastering the fretboard. I've never been a fan of the word mastering because to master anything, it's nearly impossible, at least in my personal opinion. It's a never ending process, you know, it's a lifelong thing. The word I'd rather use is understanding. If you understand the mechanics of the fretboard, or any instrument you play, you're a singer, you understand the mechanics of your body, your vocal cord, just understanding the mechanics of everything helps you better execute your music, right? So I want to talk about a whole bunch of uh, concepts from the simplest to the most complex ideas one can develop on the fretboard. And obviously I'm going to split this up into a few parts. I hate jamming all the content into one. Right, so for this lesson, I'm going to talk about four first steps. I call them the first steps, but they all come in order, right? Um, so I'm just going to quickly take my bass. And the first step comes with a little story. So I was 12. I got my first guitar, my first instrument ever. My sister bought it for me and I was looking to start guitar classes. So I started taking lessons with a, a really nice guy from church, Mr. Shalita. Shout out to him. Little did I know this lesson would be a lifelong thing. So my first lesson, we discussed the 12 tones of Western music, the sharps and flats, why they are sharp, why it's a flat. And then we just drew fretboards all lesson long. Now. I was taken aback by that. I was like, why am I doing this? Right? I thought it's okay. That's the first time. So maybe, yeah. Uh, go into my second class. Half the class, we're drawing fretboards again. And then he says, okay, here's the first chord you learn, D major. And by, th by that time, he also explained to me a triad construction. Right? So I play D major. I'm like, wait a minute. I can only play this shape in this with the open strings only in this position or the relevant octave above it. I can't play it anywhere else because the open strings don't work with it. Now, I didn't even try to play that shape anywhere else. I just could see and figure it out. And years later, I thought about it when I was in school, when I was in college, and then it hit me like, wow, it's because I was drawing all those fretboards that I was able to see it even before I placed my fingers. And that was just a real eureka moment for me. So that's the first step drawing a plain simple fretboard, 12 frets, X number of strings, de depends on how many you have. Write the notes, sharps, flats included. Do this every day. You want to do this to a point where you don't think about what's the next note after C sharp on the G string. No, you know it's a D. You know F sharp comes after F, regardless of which fret, which string it is, you know the order of it. And you also know where on the fretboard it is, right? So that gives you hyper-awareness of the fretboard. All right, so step number two and three is actually something I spoke about in a video lesson about a year ago. And it's simple. We want to take scales and practice them. Everyone likes to practice scales, but we bass players are just so bloody stubborn about having to have the roots as a starting point and the ending point. So what I like to do is to play the scale starting from the lowest available note, go into the highest available note and back down. So C major, in other words, I have the lowest is E, highest is D, and I run the scale. Right? Now that's one combination of fingering. If you want to know the exact system of the fingering I'm using, you can check out the lesson. The link is in the description below. Now, 
I played six notes. Was it six? Yeah, six notes on the first string, the E. So E, F, G, A, B, C. Now what if I only play four on the E? And then I go down to B over here. Okay. E. Now I can play the F here. But if I play the F here and I just keep going, I still have a whole octave between this D and that D to make. Right? But there's a simple solution to that. So now if I end a phrase with the pinky, I shift to the next note with the first finger. I can do that. Right? And obviously while going down, I can do the opposite. If I end on the first finger and I want to play the next note below it on the same string, I just shift. Right? It's a very common technique used. Okay, and the reason I'm trying to speed through this is because I already spoke about it. You can, you should definitely check out that lesson. Right? So, now the idea is to play different combos of the scale starting from the lowest to the highest note available. And the reason you want different combos is because you don't want to get used to just one way of doing it. Now, if I just always did this, now I'm neglecting all the notes that are here. Right? Because pretty much all the way here and that's it so whatever's happening from this C to that C is forgotten about and I don't want to do that so I want to give every note in the scale importance everywhere so all the combinations possible of the strings and how many notes per string right so now the third step is to take a regular way of playing scale root to root one to eight one to the octave but instead of doing it this way what we're going to do is we're going to displace the pitch so in, instead of playing the D here I play the D there or here if you want to get more adventurous and then the next E I can play the open and then F over here open G A down there B here and C back to C again now what this does to you it forces you to think two steps ahead why two steps ahead because you got to think the next note and the second step is to think it another octave because we don't want to play them in a sequence so this this kind of opens up your ears opens up the mind so the map of the scale is not confined to a position right so you can do this with every scale you can do this with a chromatic scale but the chromatic scale is a little weird that's a chromatic scale sounds super weird but I love it actually and you will also notice I'm trying to play those notes everywhere I can the whole neck this whole thing is my playground you know it's not just here. You don't want to confine. No, no confinement. Open it up. That's step three. Now, step four is the total opposite of what I just spoke about. It is all about confinement. And now you might be like, what the fuck is this guy on about, right? I understand, but check this out. So, <coughs> when we stay in position, all we do to change key is to shift the position to the next relevant root. C major, F, B flat. E flat and so on but that was all mechanical because the fingers know the movement I know the roots now what we're going to try to do is we're going to play a scale root to root right and we're going to play the next scale 
in the cycle of fourths, let's say for example. So C major, I mean C major goes to F major. But what I'm going to try to do is, I'm not going to start on the root. I'm going to create a little confinement. Now if I look at this C, this low C and the high C, I have all the 12 tones available within that. So all the 12 keys, all the scales, everything you can imagine is all here. Right? But remembering part one, I mean the first step, second step and the third step, you also need to know this shape is not the confinement, it's just these two notes, which means I still have all these notes available here, like on a few spots here, right? So these two pitches is the confinement. It's not the area of the neck. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play all the scales I can, but I'm not going to play any note below this C or above the C. So if I play C major, great. Now F major, B flat major, now you notice after I play that C I came down to that D over here. Reason being because I'm not allowed to go above that C and we are doing a root to root meaning from this, the first note you start we're going to the octave up of that note to finish off that scale. So again C major. F major, B flat major, E flat major, um, D uh, A flat major to D flat major. flat major ah. to B major Now, let me very quickly point this out. Now, I don't know if you're confused. Sometimes I'm confusing myself, but a few simple things to remember for this, the fourth step. We are playing root to root scales, okay? But now when I'm switching keys, I'm not doing the root literally to the root, but I'm doing the first nearest note available and I'm playing going up to the octave if it permits me within the range. If not, I displace it back down. And I'm not going below the low C or above the high C. Now I would do this for a good period of time before I further expand this. So then I can say instead of this being the limitation, I can expand it all the way to that G. Right? So this is um, a very good way to practice using a position because now you're using the position not as a position literally but you're using that first and last note as everything just imagine you had an instrument which just had a one octave range you have one string and you just had 12 frets what are you going to do you're not going to do much because you're not used to that right so this helps with using positions to an advantage now that's with this position what if I do this position? Okay, now because of the position being a little more stretched out, I can expand the limitation to the D. So if I do C major, F major, B flat major, E flat major. A flat major displacement it was out of range right so 
we are using positions, but we are trying to cover all 12 keys within that limit, limited space. I hope it makes sense, right? So just to quickly recap, four steps. And this is what I would call the beginning. Now, if you get these four steps down to a fine science and understand it inside out, man, everything becomes a piece of cake, trust me, because you just see everything even before you try to sit down with the instrument. You can just mentally visualize it, right? First step, drawing the fretboard. No scales or whatever, just all the 12 tones across 12 frets on every string you have, depending on how many strings. Second step is to play your scale starting from the lowest available note all the way to the highest available note and up and down using all combinations of strings and notes per string and shifting and positions and so on and so forth. Detail lesson will be posted in the description below. And the third step is to play scales but to displace the pitch, to displace the octave. I mean the the consecutive notes pitch is being displaced up or down whichever works right you can do this with all scales chromatic scales too and then the fourth step is to confine yourself to the position but to use the position as a limit of your range so low c high c is your limit try to play all the scales within that displace whatever notes you have to up or down because of the range limitation and then slowly expand the position and then you can just start doing your own combinations of positions to challenge yourself and when you do this you will realize playing in awkward keys is not awkward anymore E flat minor is very awkward for bass players with four strings because you don't have that low E flat but they forget all about the goodies the lowest note I have is actually an F which is just the second note in the E flat minor scale so you can make do Right? I don't have to think that position of E minor going down a half step to the E flat. No, no, no. You don't have to think that way anymore because you know the notes available and it's practical. And that leads me to say this. All these ideas that I was practicing is what made me want to stick to a four string for a long time. Because it is so limiting. It's so limiting that it pisses me off so much. But there is so much you can do with a four string. And it's ridiculous. I'm not saying don't play a five or six. I would. I, I. I'm actually waiting for my custom bass to arrive, five string. But a four string is a great school because it just really shows you so much, and it just lets you enter the whole world, the whole dimension, horizontally, and vertically. The problem with an extended range is you always go vertical, but on a four you're kind of forced to go this way because you run out of space, right? So I sincerely hope you guys enjoyed this lesson and I have a little surprise actually. Um, so I have decided to give away three free Skype lessons. I'm going to choosing the three people at random but all you have to do to get a chance at this is to comment below in the video if you actually made it to this part of the video. To comment below what do you like the most about my lessons and what don't you like the most about my lessons? I want to know both. Be truthful, even if it hurts. I don't care. I live for the fucking truth. That's me. So again, three people at random. Comment below what you like the most and what don't you like the most about my video lessons. So with that, I will see you guys pretty soon with part two. And until then, I will see you in the shed. Peace.